about my praise, my worship. The where is not important, but the who is. The where is not important, but the who is. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. To consider John in his writing, it, it takes me back to a point in my life where I take and I remember how God had blessed my life. And when I did not know what I was doing, God tolerated me and God waited until I matured in order to show me the difference between what I was doing in the church activity and really becoming intimate with him. There is a difference in what we do in worship than what we do in praise. And therefore, it is important that I point out a few things about worship. And yes, we are here on Memorial Day weekend. For a lot of people, this is a tough time. And I know that a lot of people are thinking of loved ones that are gone uh, before us. But before that was an 1868 when it was established as the first Memorial Day weekend back in 1868 to remember fallen soldiers in the Civil War, then there was a God <laughs> that he said, as often as you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. So to establish memorials toward people and to remember people it's important to the life of those that the genealogy run through. But whenever it comes to the spiritual aspect of man, I think we worship more the creature than we do the creator. And so it's important to me that I point out today how important it is that we don't get off track and we get stuck in a rut worshiping somebody that is gone that has no significant impact as to say what is taking place in your life right now. Other than the fact that that was my granddaddy, or other than the fact that that was my mama, or that was my daddy. Now, I, I know that might be ins insensitive, you think. But whenever you compare that to God, there is no comparison. Uh, let, let me say that again because I didn't get very many amens out of that. Whenever we look at life and we think that we have lost a lot, uh, that is no comparison as to what God has already given to us. Amen? Now, now, now look, look at it objectively from this point of view. It's important that we identify the points of worship and then the points of praise. The first question is, what are the differences between praise and worship? Okay, now the first thing that we got to understand that is according to Isaiah 61 and 3, it means that it is appointed unto Mount Zion to put on the garment of praise. Praise is a garment. It's apparel. It's, it's, it's something that you put on. And the reason why you put it on, there are significant reasons for putting on praise. It says in Isaiah 63 and 1, it says that the garment of praise, through the spirit of heaviness, there's a trade-off. God then transplants you like a tree, and then he therefore gives you the glorification of knowing that whatever he does in your life from that point on, you give him praise for it. In other words, the tree just bears the fruit of something that has already taken place. So whenever it comes to praise, we got to understand that we are just giving the fruit of something that God has already done. Let me give you an example. Anybody in here ever been healed by God? Okay, when you praise him, you're not praising him out of emptiness. You're praising him because of the heaviness that you've gone through, but then at the same time, it creates through your lips a fruit called praise. And therefore, you say to God, thank you. 
you know, whenever I do something nice for you, what is the right thing to say? Thank you. So we say thank you because of the praise that has been created through what we've just gone through. So it is a garment. It is the heaviness that we have gone through that we trade our heaviness for the spirit or the garment of praise. Amen? And he goes on, John says in 4 and 23, he says this. He says, the, but the hour coming and now is when the true worshipers, amen, when the true worshipers, amen, when the true worshiper, they're going to be in the garment of spirit and praise. Now, there's a difference between praise and then the spirit of truth. The garment of spirit and truth is the intimate part of worship. Okay, I, I, I'll, I'll take it a little bit further. The garment of praise is... It comes in two fashion. There, there is a, a, a fashion that it's been made for war. We praise God because of the victory we get through war, and we have to put on a different praise. But this praise is important. According to Ephesians 6 and verses 10 through 18, it talks about us not having these things that are natural in me, but it talks about putting on the full arm of God that we might be able to fight against the principalities and the powers and the wickedness of darkness in high places. It talks about we don't fight against flesh and blood. It talks about all the things that are relevant in the spirit. So we put on spiritual armor in order that we might sound the praise of victory. All right? The praise of victory. Now let's see what happens whenever we call the praise team. The praise team have songs that should be songs of praise, but then there should be songs of worship. Can I identify them with you? The first one is, according to Matthew chapter 11, there is a difference in the words of a song that is a song of war than there is a song of that is a song that is created through praise. Okay, now get this. In Matthew chapter 11 and verse 12, it says that for as long as from John the Baptist, it says, and now the kingdom of God has always suffered violence. It says now, but those that have been violated has come to make a reprimand. Uh, see, see when when you, let, let me let me let me let me help you with that because when you've been assaulted by someone in society, not only do they pay a penalty for the law that they have, you know, abused, but then there are retributions. See, see, they don't tell you that because even if you go on probation, you go in and do I have any probation officers in here? What do, the, what do your people have to do when they come in and report? They not only come in and show you their face, but then they bring in some money. That's called retribution. That means you're not only paying a debt to society with your time spent in jail, but it also means that you're going to give back to society that which you have taken, whether it be mentally, whether it be physically, or whether it be the emotional side. You're going to pay the cost. Can I get a witness in here? So the praise team should sing songs that when the devil has been caught with our stuff. When the devil has tried to annihilate us, according to Matthew chapter 11 and verse 12, it means this, that the devil not only has to pay the cost of getting out of our lives, but he has to give retribution and pay us back. For everything that he took. Look at your neighbor and tell him, say, the devil owed me something. And you know what? It is not a... <laughs> I'm not coming in here to praise the devil. I'm coming in here to praise God because the violator has been caught red-handed and I'm ready for my stuff. Look at somebody.
somebody say I'm ready for my stuff and it says that we have not only come to take our stuff back but you know what it means that I come with an attitude that means that I'm not going to just walk up and let you put it in my hand. I'm going to reach out and I'm going to take it and I'm snatching it back. Is there anybody here got some things you got to snatch back from the devil? Oh, I can't get no witnesses in here. But if you got something you need to snatch back the devil from the devil, look at him in the spirit and get ready to snatch your stuff back. Ah, I can't get no help in here. Woo! That means that every enemy that God has allowed to come my way, I stomp them under my feet. And every sword that rises up against me, God has given me the power to overtake it. Every horseman, every chariot, every crushing enemy, it means that I can now sing the song of praise. Uh, uh, you don't hear me. You don't hear me. You don't hear me. You don't hear me. <laughs> Let me help you here. Every enemy that Israel saw in Egypt and God delivers them from Egypt and Egypt comes after Israel. But in Exodus 15 and 20, when the last Israelite gets on the other side on dry land and then God releases the water while Pharaoh's chariot men and horses and, and men of war was in the middle of the sea. They were in the middle of the sea and they got caught in God's rage. And here's what Miriam did. Miriam ran to the front of the camp, got her tamarind, and all the women of Zion got their tamarinds and followed Miriam out in the middle of the congregation. And Miriam the priest, uh, you don't hear what I'm saying, the prophetess Miriam Miriam was a prophetess just like her brother Aaron was a prophet hallelujah the bible says she took the tambourine in her hand and she started playing the tambourine she started singing and she started dancing and Miriam answered the people saying the Lord had triumphed gloriously over the horsemen of Egypt and has given us the victory and he's due our praise is there anybody here that God ever trapped in your Red Sea anything in anybody that has come against your praise God has let you triumph over is there anybody here ready to say thank you So there are songs that, that creates from war that we got to do. The Bible says that when in Isaiah 18 and 6, when David gets through killing the Philistine, <laughs> David is now parading Goliath's head through the city. <laughs> and the women of Zion again, they said, Saul, they sing the song, Saul has killed his thousands. But David has killed his ten thousands. Can I get a witness in here? And the women answered and they prayed and they prayed and they praised God because David was not only a man of a thousand, but David was a man of ten thousand. So they praised God because Goliath's head was in David's hand. Is there anybody here ready to get ahead in life? <laughs> I dare you to praise him because you triumph over your enemy. Your enemy may stand taller than you, may have more mouth than you, but I promise you if you take the sword of the spirit, open your mouth and say what God said this day devil the Lord has delivered you into my hands somebody say yes <laughs> don't mess with me now I'm just telling you, I'm a man of war. 
shoot. I'm a man of war. I don't just praise him when, I, when the sun is shining. I praise him when I'm going through. When I'm going through my battles. The Lord is my battle axe. The Lord is the strength of my life. The Lord is ahead of my life. The Bible said the Lord is my salvation and my life. In whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Hallelujah. He's my buckler and my shield. He's able to keep me from falling. He's able to present me faultless. Uh, hallelujah. Uh, somebody ought to praise him. Because he made you a man uh, or a woman of valor. Look at somebody and say, I can fight now. You know what? I ain't scared either. Look at somebody and say, I ain't scared. Oh, I used to be fearful, but I realized that the Lord hadn't given me a coat of fear because the Bible said fear is a spirit. And I told you, you got to put on the spirit of praise, but just like you can put on the spirit of praise, you can put on the spirit of fear. So the Lord has not given me. Somebody need to get out of that fear. You, you, you're scared of your bill collectors. Get out of that. Turn around and face it. And say, you know what? I don't have your money right now, but I'm working on it. Ah, I'm working on it. And get out of that spirit. And say, I'm coming out of this. Oh, you don't hear what I'm saying. The Lord has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love. You put on some love. And the Bible said perfect love casts out all fear. The Bible said that the Lord has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. See, 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 you shouldn't have let me stay up all night. You shouldn't let me get up under my press, y'all, like I did last night. Because I'm ready for you this morning. The devil can't stand under this. Because you know what? When I got to praising him for who he is and for what he's done, it doesn't matter whether I'm in this building or not. I was driving my truck to Lubbock and I got to thinking about the goodness of Jesus and all that he done for me. My soul. Worship songs are very different. <laughs> we have seen that their <laughs> spirit and truth. <laughs> we can enter into a place whenever we're in the garment of spirit and truth. To where it takes us to another level. Another dimension. Anybody ever read... When you got in trouble and you remember to dial 911? Anybody ever dial 911 in the Bible? Anybody know what 911 in the Bible is? I'm, I'm, I'm asking a question. I want a response. I dare you to turn to Psalm 91 and 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That means I quit praying and praising. And I step into worship because if I'm going to dwell in the holy place, all that I was doing was doing on the outer court. The Bible says enter into his court with and be 
and blesses. But when you step in the holy place, in the holies of hope, all that was done on the outside was external things like raising your hand, stomping your feet, playing your tambourine, saying to each other, yes. But when you step in the holy place, you forget about who's around you. You forget about all you've been through. And you're in the presence of a holy God. And God says, I want to be intimate with you. Let, let me help you. Let me help you. You remember when Jesus said this. Jesus said, foxes have holes. Birds have nests. But the son of man have no place to lay his head. Now get this, get this. It, it, it means two things, naturally and spiritually. In the natural, whenever a bird makes a nest, it's fixing to get intimate. I know fixing to ain't being, a, it's not a word. But excuse my vernacular. When a bird builds a nest, it ain't building no nest just to build a nest. Because Mr. Bird is going looking for Miss Bird. So that they can come into the dwelling place. Foxes just don't dig holes to be digging holes when they when they when they're celibus, they can live anywhere under the tree, around the tree, in some weeds, around some weeds. But whenever they need a miss fox. Because he want to invite her into his dwelling. And you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, everything has its place to reproduce itself. But he said, I don't have nowhere that I can lay my ideas, recreate who I am. See, because he had not yet died. But now that he's and raised and sitting at the right hand of the Father, the Bible said we should worship him in spirit and in truth. And one, one, one gospel writer said we should love him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our might. So that means that when I get intimate with God. I should be recreating. Woo. See, see, that's what I tell you. See, anybody can praise him. Because that's what goes on in the outer court. Under the sunlight. But when God invites you into the dwelling place. It is candlelight. And show bread. Oh no! It just it just missed somebody. See, see, see. On the outside, you can do all that, and external praise and all that is good. It's useful. It's useful for encouraging you. But God is inviting you under candlelight. And divine lights so that you could get an inspiration. Am I making any sense? <laughs> Am I making any sense? Do you get it or do I need to go back over it? The difference is, the difference is, is what you do. In the outer court is PG. It needs parental guidance. See, the young saints need to know what it means to praise God. So the older saints should be leading them. There shouldn't be anybody on the praise team that hasn't had an experience where they can guide 
somebody else. No one should be in the pulpit that has not had an experience. Because if you don't know God, you sure can't lead nobody else. You can't just play because you're talented. You need to be anointed. Uh, you don't hear what I'm saying. Say anointing is what destroys the yoke. I know how we quote it. Anointing breaks the yoke. No, no, no. If you break it, you can super glue it back together. But when you destroy it, it means it's in so many pieces that you don't have enough time. I just have to put that disclaimer out there because anybody and everybody can praise God. But see, when you step in the next realm, it's an R rating. That means it's restricted. It has... Y'all don't want me to say this. Y'all don't want me to say this. But if you show a baby this, and, and see, you got to be careful on PG. Because if you don't go with them, they won't know what's real and what's not real. Now just think of trying to bring an immature saint over into something that is only for mature saints. And this has been the problem in the church. We know where we worship, but we don't know who we worship. We know how to tease God, but we don't want to commit to God. We know how to arouse the spirit, but we don't know how to let the spirit have his way. Check somebody, check somebody next to you and said, This is for mature audiences. <laughs> Hebrews 13 and 4 says, Marriage, and this is compared to marriage. He says in Hebrews 13 and 4, he said, Marriage is honorable in all, and says, And the bed is undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers. God shall judge. Get, get, get this, get this, get this, get this. What we do over here, if we can pass this and be mature, when you get over here, it's purity. But let me tell you what has happened in our society. It's so much stuff that is going on on television. That has desensitized us. That we don't know what intimacy is. Every time you turn around on the soap opera. Listen. Listen, I, I just got tired of watching. I stopped watching one time for 10 years. Come back and the same thing's happening. Now, how many times, let, listen, I'm just telling you how, how we have taken away from the intimacy in the spirit because of the natural things that we have allowed to desensitize us. Okay, this one is married to this one, but it's having a baby by this one. And then this one is, is, is you know, is married to the sister. And then the sister finds out about the baby and then she's married to, you know, she gets a divorce and marries his brother. And then the baby that she's having, not either his nor the one she's married to. Wearing the name, but not his. 
in the church, we, we play with things that don't belong to God. We get infatuated by a lifestyle that desensitizes us, that does not allow us to get into the presence of God, that makes us holy before God. And therefore, we expect for God to accept what we do and then bless us in our mess. But let me tell you something. Can I be real with you? Sometimes we can't get the blessing because we're too messy. <laughs> Ain't nobody going to say nothing to me. Brother, brother Darrell, give me a little bit more volume. Just a little bit, just a little bit, just a little bit better. Can you hear the words that are coming out of my mouth? If you want to be in the presence of a holy God, he said, be ye holy, for I am. Oh, you don't hear. Oh. That sounds like he's a, he's a Kojic preacher now. No, no, what he's saying is, he said, you become whole. And then he said, you step in the presence of a whole God. That way you don't have to bring fragments into the presence of God. But when you step into the presence of God, you are like him. You look like him. You act like him. And you reproduce. God. Man, time just, time just passing me. Time, time is... There's a difference in the manifestation of gifts of the spirit. See, praise releases the tongue and the tongue speaks and the tongue goes off and the hands go up. Shouting is taking place. Running is happening. And everybody is saying hallelujah and thank you, Jesus. But see, when you get into worship, worship becomes prophetic. See, over here is a bunch of activity. But when you get over here, you hush. See, y'all done made me come out of my coat. You know what we do? Over here is a bunch of activity. But see, when we get over here, when we're whole, and in the presence of a holy God, God don't want you to say nothing. God serenates us. See, see, whenever we, we praise him, we're, we're doing a bunch of activity. And that's good. Because we are supposed to create with our lip praise. But when you're in worship, worship means you shut up. And let God speak to you. And God starts, he starts telling you about yourself. Never condemning you. Never condemning you, but calling to your potential <laughs> when you're in his presence. Never say what you ain't going to be. Never say what you'll never have, but always seems to you, you were created to be my bride. You were created in my image. You were created. To worship me. You were created. To bring me glory. And I made you the head. Not the tail. I put you above. Not beneath. So when you go back out there. Know that you lead my presence. With my blessing. That anything you need. To make what I said to you come to pass. That if I have to come through hell. If I have to come through hot water because you belong to me, I'm on my way. How many remember watching Underdog back in the early 60s? When sweet Polly Pierberry got in trouble. <laughs> and she started singing, oh where, oh where is my underdog gone? Oh where, oh where could he be? And though he was a mild man of janitor, underdog ear would raise up and he would hear sweet Polly purebred 
over everything else. So what I'm telling you is, is the church is sweet Polly Pibri. And whenever she get in trouble, all she have to do is say, oh God, oh God, why has my God gone? And the Bible said, the Bible said that he'll come, hallelujah, to your rescue. The Bible said he is not he, even in thy mouth. That if you call on him, look at somebody and say, all you have to do is call on him. Hey, hey, hey. All you have to do is call on him. And the Bible said, and ye shall be saved. Mm. so the gifts come I'm not going to read this but you, you, you write this down 1 Corinthians 14 and 4 when, when, when you get in the presence of God the atmosphere changes it changes from the tense and the tension of war and you fighting every day and doing everything and you're, you're fighting against this things are happening to you over here and pray but when you get into worship <laughs> All tension leaves. Has anybody got in his present lately? And you forgot about your trouble? Though it was present, it was just on the outside. And when you got there, here's what happened. God releases the gift of healing, the gift of miracles, the gift of discernment of spirit, the message of the tongue with the interpretation. See, out here we can speak in tongues and the Bible says out here you're speaking to God. And see, over here, I don't have to explain nothing because I can't explain it because I'm not talking to you. When I'm in my trouble, let me alone. Don't add to my trouble. Pray for me. I told you I got some problem. I just, I can't help but tell you, I got some problem. And so when I'm over here going through something, you pray for me. And if I go off in a tongue, don't worry about it. I'm not crazy. I'm just speaking to the spirit of God. And over here in worship, it will be interpreted for me through the spirit. The spirit of discernment. Ha, is which is one of the gifts. To interpret what has been said. My spirit picks it up when I get in worship. Uh, woo, Lord help me say it like I see it. Lord, help me say it like I saw it. <sighs> so, so what we do over here becomes insignificant. That's why Jesus told the woman at the well, she said, she said, this is where we worship. I perceive that you are a prophet. And so I want to talk to you what you want to talk about. <laughs> and what you want to talk about is church. But I go to church at full armor. And Jesus told her, said, woman, if you knew who it was that you were talking to, you wouldn't be wanting to go to full armor today. You would be wanting to talk to me. Look at somebody and say, you ain't important. Whenever I step in here, you're not important. That's why we get off. We start looking at people. And we stop wanting people to measure up to us and our expectations. But when we come in here, I love you, but I'm not studying you. I love you, but right now, it's not about you. I appreciate you, but when I'm in here, it's not about you. Tell somebody say it's not about you. Get
get this. Can I finish this? I know it's 11 o'clock and, and some folks are at, and some folks gotta go. It's, it's almost 11 o'clock and some folks gotta go. But can I just finish this? I, I, can't, I can't leave it right here. And so just as the wife is being serenaded by her husband, when you're in worship, God serenades you. And then the gifts come. When a husband serenades his wife, and brings her into intimacy. What comes out of intimacy is pregnancy. Intimacy means into me see. Look in me and see me for who I am. So the physical position doesn't mean anything. <laughs> you know, the, the position, whether I'm throwing my hand up, whether I'm saying hallelujah, don't mean anything because it's not through the external. But when you get over here, the one thing you can't forget is the spirit and your mind. See all the flopping, rolling, and spitting, and all that stuff is over here. But when you get over here, you gotta quit flopping, you gotta quit spitting, you gotta quit speaking, because when it perfect shall come, all that is done away with. And when you step in the presence of God, all that is done away with, because now you need to pay attention. You can't get no word from God. Da, 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 da. Got a bow tie, got a tie, got a tie, got a bow tie. Got a hundred, got a hundred, got a hundred civic. You can't hear God doing all that. So when you get over here and worship, you got to shut your mouth. Quit doing all the activity and open your mind up and let your spirit be your guide. The old folks used to sing it like this. Let the Holy Ghost lead you. Let the Holy Ghost lead you. Let the Holy Ghost lead. All the way. All the way from where? Exterior stuff. Earth, exterior stuff. Heaven, shut your mouth. Now, now you, you understand now why they sung it, right? Because the Lord, they wanted the Lord to stop all their activity and bring them in his presence. He's a mighty good, 